So here in lecture 5.2, we're going to continue looking at two-level logic synthesis. And I have to admit, this is probably one of the most complex sounding talk titles I've got, the Reduce Expand Irredundant Loop, which sounds very impressive indeed, and is the name of an extremely famous heuristic for doing two-level synthesis, two-level optimization, that uses the idea of reshaping a cover so that we get a good, but not necessarily perfect, solution. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to take a high-level tour through all of the key steps of this famous heuristic method for two-level logic optimization. So let's go see how that works. So let's assume we are starting with a truth table. But um, just to make this a little more realistic, let's note that we're going to start with a truth table that can have input don't cares. And what input don't cares means is that each row of the truth table can match many rows of the full truth table. And we do that by just allowing um, people to put an asterisk which says you can match either a 0 or a 1. So for example, um, on the um, input truth table that I'm showing on the, on the bottom right here, um, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 rows of the truth table. And they're going to each turn into some sort of a cube. And they're called P, Q, R, S, and T respectively. And I've got a Carnot map on the upper right um, of the diagram, um, four by four, a typical 4 by 4 um, grid, A, B on the top, C, D on the left. Um, one's in the top left, 2 by 2 squares, bottom right, 2 by 2 squares, the entire bottom row is ones, and the entire second row of the Carnot map is ones. And I've got a bunch of covers here. I'm going to talk through them one at a time. So let's talk about the, uh, the row of the truth table, uh, 0 star, 0 star. Um, that's really um, just this one right here, the upper left 2 by 2. Um, this is QP because obviously A is 0 for those ones and C is 0 for those ones, but uh, B and D can be anything. So that's just a very simple way of specifying more than one row of um, the truth table, more than one single one in the Carnot map. Um, 0 star 1 0, which is cube Q, um, will be this one here on the bottom. That will be the bottom left two, bottom column left two ones. That's cube Q. Of um, course, if you like, it's always possible to specify um, individual ones uh, in, the, in the Carnot map. Um, that's, that's these guys right here. So this one in the Carnot map is S, and this one in the Carnot map is R. Um, second row of the Carnot map, right two squares. Um, and uh, T is going to turn out to be the bottom right, cor or a bottom right corner of uh, the Carnot map. That will be cube T. So this just makes it easy to specify a function with lots and lots of variables. You know, you've got a function with like 25 variables in it. You do not want to write a truth table of 2 to the 25 rows. Believe me. You just want to specify where the function is a 1. And that's probably a whole lot less than 2 to the 25 rows. Um, you can specify this with these input don't cares. It makes a very, very tidy and very convenient way of doing that. So this um, truth table with its input don't cares, um, each row with its um, um, pattern matchability specifies a product, a cube. Might not be prime. That's important to know. There's nothing that says this is a very good cover. But it surely is a cover of all of the ones. So if you will, it's a bad Carnot map. Our goal is to start with this and then do some optimization. Now, the first step is to expand each cube to be a prime. So expand is a heuristic. And this is actually going to get done one cube at a time. So we're going to take each cube in some appropriate heuristic order, and we're going to make it as big as we can possibly be. Um, and what that means is that we're going to make it prime. Now, let's be clear, there might be different ways of doing this for any specific cube. You, know, you might be able to grow it in one direction or a different direction, and we're not really talking yet about how we do that. And so we've got three cubes in our current design um, that have been expanded. Um, the S cube is no longer a single one in the Carnot map. Uh, the S cube is now the entire second row of the Carnot map. And the R cube is no longer a single one in the Carnot map. The R cube is a two by two square of cubes in the Carnot map. It's the middle two rows and the right two columns. And the Q cube is no longer the left two ones in the bottom row of the Carnot map. The Q cube, as it has been expanded, is now the whole bottom row of the Carnot map. So the new solution is a prime cover. Every cube is as big as it can be. 
but it is not the best we can necessarily do. There's more work we might be able to do on this to improve it. So what's the next step we do? Well, the next step is we try to remove redundant cubes. And the name of this heuristic is irredundant. Okay, The irredundant operation removes redundant cubes from the cover. And a cube is redundant if I can remove it and all of its ones are still covered by other cubes in the rest of the cover. And it's important to note that we can clearly remove cube R. And I'm just going to put some little hash marks across R here so you can sort of see it. Um, cube R is the um, right two columns intersected with the middle two rows. Cube R is covered entirely by, every, by, by some combination of the other cubes, so we can get rid of it. And if we remove it, the new solution will still be a prime cover, and it is technically minimal. And what minimal means is I cannot remove another cube without breaking it, without uncovering some ones. This is one of these local minimum things, like I showed on this conceptual graph a couple of slides ago. However, we might not be done. We might still be able to do better. So what do we do next? This is a very interesting idea. We're going to reduce the prime cover. Reduce is another heuristic. We're going to take each cube and we're going to shrink it as much as possible, but we are not allowed to uncover any one. So we are not allowed to break the function. But we are simply going to take the cubes that are covering the function and shrink them so that none of them overlap. What's going to happen here is that we can shrink the S cube, um, which is suddenly going to become the right two ones in the second column. And we're going to shrink the Q cube. And so we are going to become the left two ones in the bottommost row. This is our reduced, reshaped cover. This is a really strange beast. Um, this is, if this was a Carnot map, I'd fail you, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is a bad solution. But this is a really amazing, essential step. This new solution has a different shape. Um, and what's going to happen is that from this seed, we are going to expand it again. And perhaps when we expand it, we'll be able to find yet another superior solution. This is the critical step in this um, key chain of heuristics that we're showing here. This is the idea that I said in the intro talk. I need a way of, of you know, making a big step from one solution to a different solution, from one local minimum to a different local minimum. And the big trick is you reduce things to this strange, non-overlapping, non-prime cover. And then when you expand it again, you might get a different answer. You might get a better answer. You might find some new cubes that are redundant that you can kill. So if we apply the same hur um, expand heuristic again, um, you might get a different answer because you started from a different starting point. And again, when you run expand, part of the goal is going to be to see if you can overlap some other cubes so that they can go away. Oh, look, I've done that in this particular example. I've expanded the S cube by basically growing it down. And I've expanded the Q cube, which is the bottom row, by um, growing it to the right. And suddenly, if we were to go take a look at the T cube, we see, oh, look, I can make the T cube go away. Because I had a different solution after reduction, because when I did expand, I got a new solution, I have found a new local minimum. I can, I can work with this. So now we again run the irredundant heuristic. But it is starting from a different cover, so it can get a different answer. We took each cube and we expanded it to make it prime, but we also tried to cover the cubes um, to make them redundant. It's part of the heuristic. So in this example, we can kill the T cube. And I'm just drawing that in. So the t-cube is now the bottom right 2 by 2 square, rightmost two columns, bottommost two rows of the Carnot map. Uh, that cube can go away. I'm just going to circle that and sort of draw it. That cube can go away as the result of, re of redundant. Um, after this, the cover is again prime. And it's irredundant, and I can't remove anything to make it smaller. So it's still some sort of a, of a local optimum. We're just not sure how good a local optimum. Now look, in this particular example, I got lucky. I got the best answer. Right After that set of reduce, expand, irredundant heuristics, I got the best answer. 
Um, this will generally not happen, you know, exclamation point, exclamation point. I cannot guarantee you that this is going to happen. But what I can guarantee you, and this is the big important takeaway, what I can guarantee you is that this thing is prime, can't take any cube and make it bigger. This thing is minimal, can't remove anything, and irredundant, which is sort of the same thing. Um, this is a really good local minimum. This is a really good local solution. And it turns out in practice that this iterative improvement by reshaping can produce really excellent solutions and can do so really fast. This entire sequence of ideas is really famous. This is the Reduce, Expand, Irredundant Loop, which was the, basically the name of the title of this lecture. And so, you know, what do you start with? Well, you start with some sort of a um, prime cover, right? You can do that by taking, for example, your um, bad truth table cover and then expanding it. Right. You could then run reduce on it, which gives you something that is not prime. You could then run expand on that, which will give you something that's prime and different, but also maybe redundant. You actually you hope it's redundant because you're trying to get rid of some cubes. You can then run irredundant on that, and you will get something that is prime and irredundant. And then you go back and you do it again. What are you going to do next? You're going to reduce it. Maybe you get it something with a different shape. It's kind of a pivot. Let you see, well, maybe I can get out of this local minimum, get myself to a better local minimum. And so you keep running, reduce, expand, irredundant, reduce, expand, irredundant, and basically until it stops getting better. This is a really famous idea, maybe the most famous idea in the two-level synthesis universe. And there's also a famous tool called um, Espresso. So Espresso started at IBM and it finished at Berkeley. Um, there is a very famous book from 1984 by Bob Brayton, Gary Hechtel, Curtis McMullen, and Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli that's definitely kind of the key reference for this stuff. Um, Rick Rudell's master's thesis from Berkeley in 1986 is also a pretty good source for a, for a lot of the deep structure. Um, and uh, Nani DiMichele's textbook from McGraw-Hill in 1994 is also another really good place to look for the um, you know, a kind of a textbook level presentation of this stuff. So this is the high level tour of two level synthesis. Um, boy, there's just a lot of really interesting stuff in this universe. Um, I wish I had time to talk about a lot of it. So what I'm going to do in the next lecture is just give you one tour of one step um, to try to give you some of the flavor of how this stuff actually works. So let's go take a look at that.